uh, uh, short talk uh, to your students and uh, your invitees. Thank you, Isaac. I will turn it to you. So hello everyone and welcome to a new uh, Kent seminar lecture. Uh, today I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Hassan Bahia. Uh, professor Bahia is uh, currently a professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, Wisconsin, Madison, sorry. He's also the director of, uh, uh, of the modified uh, asphalt research center called MARC, which he established. Professor Bahia has a long history of impactful research. research. He has more uh, than 100 peer review publication and also a lot of uh, reports. Uh, he, his research interests mainly focus on pavement design and, uh, and construction, uh, with a focus also on material, uh, material, pavement materials, especially the modified one in terms of binder and also as, as a mixture. Uh, today he will be discussing with us uh, the high strain stress characterization of asphalt binder. Uh, as usual, the presentation will be 40 minutes, followed by 20, uh, 20 minutes question and answers. So if you have any question, you have two options. It's either you write it in the comment section and I can ask it on your behalf. And the other option is to raise your hand and you'll directly ask uh, your question to Professor Bahia. Uh, now, and without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Bahia. Thank you, Isaac, for the kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, so I will try to be within the 40 minutes. I don't think uh, I have uh, really too much really to say today, uh, but let me give you a bit of background. How did this topic actually came around? Uh, I actually asked a suggestion for uh, what topic the, uh, I should be talking about and the uh, title of uh, large strain or as large, uh, or the topic of large strain uh, came, came around. It just happened that last year we finished uh, uh, a study uh, working on this topic again. So I uh, took uh, a look at the background of this large stress, large strain uh, characterization. Uh, some of us like to ca call it nonlinear evaluation. Uh, so I thought that this would be a very good topic to really discuss with you and uh, with the others uh, that are interested in this uh, topic. So I will talk a little bit about why we need to consider large stress and strain. Uh, and the reason I want to focus on this is I think many of you uh, understand that we live in uh, today with a specification that uh, is mostly focused on the small stress and strain. And I will uh, briefly uh, explain why that happened and why do we need to go beyond the small stress and uh, strain. And then what's interesting during the last 25 years, there has been a very uh, really uh, consistent trend that we are moving toward uh, this uh, uh, objective of characterizing the large stress and strain. So what is so special about uh, large stress and strain? I will explain that. I also uh, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about oxidative aging as a function of strain. And the reason I want to talk about it is for many, uh, many years, really, I was puzzled by some of the reports saying, well, you know, we, we are testing fatigue of binder of mixtures. And what we're finding is when you age the material, actually it becomes better in fatigue. So I will have to, uh, I will try to address this issue. Then I, I thought it's very appropriate that we link some of the innovations from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with some of the recent work that we have been doing. And uh, because I'm one of the fans of this test, uh, they call the IFIT, of course, uh, I will show that how we could actually uh, clearly explain how the binder fatigue is related or fits in that and therefore we feel that the test is, is really the right one to evaluate mixtures and then I conclude with the, some remarks. So before I get into the results and the data and the graphs, I thought it's very important for us to look at this, uh, this uh, issue of the wide uh, range of scales that our asphalt technology uh, covers. Uh, it is very, very interesting that we actually uh, bridge the, the gap between the uh, smallest uh, scale and the largest scale with our specification. I don't know if really many industries actually can do that. I think you all recognize we start with the components, the aggregates and the binder, and both of them can actually be at a very micro scale, if you will, because we look at very specific properties 
uh, that mostly dominated by this smaller scale, if you will, of the uh, material. Then we go through a mastic phase and then we uh, put larger aggregates and finally we put something together, we call it asphalt mixture phase. Then we ship it, lay it on the ground and then we put, put it into a pavement structure. And then what we're worried about is all of this work that we've done will result in good resistance to at least <clears throat> two major problems. One is the rotting and the other is cracking, different types of cracking that we can uh, talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's really at, at interest here is this uh, big uh, leap from the properties and specifications of the uh, components that are much smaller scale to this big structure that is, is much, much larger uh, and so on. Uh, the reason I talk about large stresses and strains is, uh, uh, is here. These, uh, re these distresses, if you will, or failures are dominated actually by larger strains. And if you look at the typical pavement of four to six inches, and if you look here, there is about inch and a half or two inch of rot, you can immediately uh, recognize that the scale of the deflection uh, indicates the failure is happening at a much, much larger scale than what we use today into testing. Certainly most of, most of us recognize uh, that in the lab or in the field, when we crack a mixture, we are stretching it beyond uh, its small strain or small uh, stress behavior. So uh, it, I would actually argue if we think about this uh, wide, wide uh, range of scales, we should be recognizing that testing at this linear viscoelastic or small stress, small strain could be a little bit insufficient or could be actually uh, extremely misleading. And I will uh, speak to that. So why do we need to look at the damage resistance uh, of uh, binders? I, mean, I think most of you recognize that if we take a typical uh, graph or stress versus strain, uh, you know, the linear viscoelastic range is, uh, is extremely small compared to the larger scale where actually failures are happening. So some of us like to call this linear viscoelastic and this is nonlinear, but actually what we see here in this circle here is the real damage. This is where the rutting happens. This is where the cracking actually happens. Is this a new concept? The answer is no. The NCHRP report 459 was published uh, about 20 years ago today. And that was very clear at that time that when they tested modified asphalts in particular, they found that there is really disconnect. And I'll show some of the data from that old report. Uh, what we found is that binder resistance to damage is extremely important. And therefore, if you want to characterize these binders and select them, you better be in that range. We also uh, found um, in, 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 in field or in lab studies that modification impact is actually most important in the damage resistance, not necessarily only in the linear viscoelastic. There is some effect of the modifiers. You know, we change the PG grade by putting additives and so on. But if you look at the total behavior, particularly in the damage, you see most of the benefits of these more expensive material appears in the damage. Here's an example of what you find. Now, this is a schematic, but I'll show you actual data. Here are two PG binders. Uh, both of them are exactly of the same uh, grade, PG 64 minus 22. 64 minus two is the most widely used grade probably in North America. However, as you increase the stress and strain beyond the level of the specification, if you remember, we test unaged asphalt at 12% strain. We test RTFO binders at 10% strain. We test PAV aged binders at 1% strain. And there was a focus attempt to uh, simplify the specification by looking at the linear range. Because once you go to linearity, people are gonna ask you, well, what, which stress do you want me to measure at? And how long I should be increasing the stress until failure and so on. So we all recognize that damage behavior is much more complicated to really capture in a simple specification uh, uh, scenario. But it appears that we have no choice. And if we don't go to the damage behavior, 
we will miss the opportunity of separating or actually ranking different materials uh, in the right way. Here's an example of data collected for rutting of asphalt mixtures. This is not binder data. This is the uh, unconfined compression test. And you can see actually these binders are approximately of the same G star over sine delta. In fact, this is weaker than the one in purple. The, black, the one in the black or uh, dark green is a softer, relatively speaking, than this one. And however, when you look at the mixture rotting, it's totally opposite. And it's so different that you can see here at 15,000 cycles, I have almost doubled the rotting for this binder that I thought is better than uh, the one that I am using here. So there is not only a, a, a theoretical dilemma with our use of the small strain, there is actual lab and field data showing mixtures behaving very differently when you go to a higher stresses and strain. This is a, a set of data from uh, this NCHRP report. It's actually a published chart in that report, which compares mixture rutting, looking at the creep rate or the slope here called S, which is the secondary slope uh, rate versus the binder G star sine delta. Same temperatures, same aggregate structure, if you will. So it's the same mix design, but we just changed the binder. Look at this data set here. You can be anywhere between 6,000 Pascals or 6 kPa up to 24 kPa, yet your mixture behavior is approximately the same, the same creep slope. And people said, well, but this is because the aggregate structure and rutting really dominate the structure. The fact is, this is not the case. When we took these binders and tested them in a slightly different way and took them to the uh, level of damage to the large stress and the large strain, we could actually find much better correlation with the behavior of these mixtures. As you probably most of you know, the future of this industry, the asphalt industry, is in modification and recycling. And when you use more recycled material or when you use more modifier, you totally change the behavior of these binders and these mixtures. And what we found is most of these really successful modification technique will actually change the location of the failure envelope. Again, I'm going back to really elastic behavior with very simple stress strain and forgetting about the time domain because really the time domain is just an additional complexity. But we see very significant increase in the failure limits when you put modification into your asphalt. Well, again, if you look at this chart, you will recognize that what's important is this region. The most important difference between modified asphalt and unmodified asphalt is this shift in the failure envelope. Whether the failure is in terms of permanent deformation or the failure in terms of resistance to cracking, you see this pushing on the envelope so that the capacity of the material can take more of these stresses and strains. So I told you, if you go to larger stresses and strains, you will find much better uh, a distinction between these materials. And this is the proof of it. This is a creep and recovery test in the DSR. Same tool that we use with measuring G star over sine delta, but the G star over sine delta is only limited into this region, the very small stress and strain. When we took the permanent strain in the binder to much larger levels, in this case, this is the number of cycles or the time we have loaded them, we started seeing very significant differentiation between three binders of the same grade. This is an oxidized binder, no polymers in it. This is a, a, another binder with some polymers of a certain type, and this is a third one. So what we're missing is really the opportunity to capture that behavior. And the only mistake we're making I call it mistake, or I probably some of you uh, call it, you know, missing opportunity. The missing opportunity is to go to the actual stresses and strain uh, range that will differentiate between these different materials. So have we adopted some of the ideas? I just mentioned that it's been 20 years since these concepts were discussed. The answer is yes. 
And it, it, it really moved so quickly, in my opinion, if you look at the asphalt specification history, now we have a new test called the MSCR, multiple stress creep and recovery. And in fact, if you look at the multiple stress creep and recovery, you will immediately recognize that the strain we're going to is much, much higher than the normal strain that you usually see. Here's an example. This is actually 10% strain. This is actually, you know, one order of magnitude higher. So this is 100% strain. And in many of these pointers, when you use the MSCR and calculate the GNR, you will actually find you are in the thousands of percents of these pointers. And as far as I can tell, a lot of agencies, a lot of uh, very experienced person, people, in this business really like this test because finally they can see significant differences in the behavior and they can relate them much better to the actual mixture rutting uh, performance. Is fatigue a different topic? And the reason I, I, I bring fatigue here because I will spend about 20 minutes talking about the uh, Illinois uh, uh, flexibility index test uh, because actually it helped us uh, confirm some of these concepts. Here is the binder fatigue parameter that we still unfortunately use in the specification. Not because we are very happy with it, we are still struggling to find a good replacement for it. And I think in a few years, we will all agree and get some consensus on replacing it. What's important is not this really, is the important is the first step is to recognize there is some problem with the small stress, small strain test like the G star time sign delta. Here is the fatigue life of mixtures, and here is the binder G star time sign delta. There is absolutely very little relationship. As you can see, whether you like the R square or you don't like it, it's not important. This is almost a scatter plot. And in fact, if you look at, at, these, at these values, you can hardly tell which material you should be selecting based on these values and, and so on. So what do we do? I think uh, several of us have worked on a new test which is called the binder fatigue or the uh, linear amplitude sweep. So what's the different in the linear amplitude sweep that we are doing? In fact, it contains two tests. One of them is exactly what we're doing today, but we run the small strain with a frequency sweep to see the, the time dependency of the binder. The more important part is actually the upper portion, this, which is called the uh, strain amplitude sweep. Most of you that have worked with the IFIT test, you can see the resemblance of this, uh, this results to what we get out the IFIT. Now, this is a total coincidence, and we certainly don't use the data and analyze it in a similar way to what you do in the IFIT test. But it is very interesting to see the stage at which the binder is still uh, you know, behaving like a linear material until it gets to a peak where you know the, the damage or the cracking, if I may call it, and we actually could prove there's cracking in the DSR, you know, start propagating, and then you'll see the slope going down just like what you do in the IFIT and so on. Instead of using a, the simple procedure you have in the IFIT, we looked at the post-peak slope and you look at the area under the curve, we selected the viscoelastic continuum damage. And some of you recognize this equation where you look at the damage intensity and how it changes with C, and C is just a relative modulus. So modulus versus damage give you an imprint of how the fatigue is progressing in any material using the continuum damage. But out of this comes a very conventional equation that we all recognize, which is a fatigue law. So the number of cycles to failure in the binder is equal to A times a strain to a power law function or a power law constant, if you want. Well, these A and B are related to the maximum strain. So actually, if you look at fatigue conventional equation, it definitely tells you, look, it's all about the strain. So if we all know this equation, we use it in so many different applications. How come when we come to testing the binder, we only test at small strain and say, oh, well, uh, we will figure out how to estimate the behavior at larger strains. We don't have to do that. This is the same machine, the DSR, and all what we did is told the machine to increase the strain until we see this, uh, the failure behavior. And by taking this, 
and applying the viscoelastic continuum damage, we can actually determine A and B as a function of the strain level. So what do we get out of this, uh, I call the strain amplitude sweep or the high strain uh, test, if you will. You get this very simple line, straight line, relating the estimated fatigue life as in number of cycles. You can define this failure at 30% damage, 35% damage, which means 35% uh, reduction in the modulus, or you can make it 50%, or some of us pick a certain point on the stress strain curve, like the uh, peak stress, and calculate the A and B. So A is the intercept of these lines, and B is the slope of these lines, very similar to the M value in the IFIT procedure, but it's calculated in a different way. And what you look here is strain level. And you can see actually here, I'm just covering this narrow range of 0.5 to 50% strain. But this is a classic fatigue behavior of many different materials, elastic or uh, viscoelastic. What's also interested in, interesting is seeing the effect of the aging on uh, the fatigue law. And what we found out is, you can see here, this is short-term oven aging of an axial mix. We took the binder and extracted and recovered from the mix and tested it after uh, 2 plus 2 aging, 2 plus 8, and 2 plus uh, 16 hours. And what you see is a very clear rotation of the curve in a very specific way. What is the way? It's actually clockwise rotation of the fatigue law. And what really struck me after I, I you know, studied the IFIT test, you observe a very similar phenomenon. As you age, you see the post-peak slope uh, get increasing significantly. And in fact, I'll show you the relationship between these two slopes. So it is very clear to me that without measuring the behavior at multiple strain levels, including the large strains, we could be missing a lot of the important properties or binders or mixtures. Uh, you know, your university was the first to focus on the post-peak slope and looking at what happens when actually the clock start propagating. In a very successful way, you could actually link it to the field. Similar to what we're seeing here, your data can actually confirm what we need to do, which is looking at the uh, higher strain levels. So the behavior in fatigue and some of these reports that you can, you can see, they put the mix or the binder in aging. They took it out, retested it, and become stronger. Well, I can show it to you here. If I am before this uh, uh, rotation point or inflection point, some people like to call it, if I am measuring my properties within this strain domain, I will definitely see an improvement in fatigue every time I age. Does this mean the fatigue became better? Well, it depends. If your structure is behaving in this very small strain range, then the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, many people said, you know, thick pavements behave very well with aging and fatigue is not affected by aging. Well, because these thick pavements could be under very small strains. And therefore, when, you, when the material is aged, the modulus goes up and that will reduce the amount of damage in the layer itself. However, if you miss this point and go beyond that, you will see the traditional effect of aging, which is as the aging uh, increases, the slope of the line increases, and therefore the number of cycles to failure will decrease dramatically. Now, this is a binder run as unaged, RTFO, PAV, a double PAV, and quadruple PAV. And you see the consistency in this behavior, which really tell us the importance of the strain spectrum and the uh, lack of really uh, focus on the strain could get us in trouble. Like saying, well, I age the material, it becomes uh, uh, you know, stronger. One of our DOT engineers said, when they, they saw the data of better uh, fatigue, he said, oh, all what I have to do then is wait for the pavement to get stronger. Is that what you're telling me? Of course, the answer is no. I think we were misled 
by testing in the conditions that give you the impression that the fatigue is getting better while in fact there is a rotation in the slope of the line of the fatigue that will clarify the effect of aging is not as good. Finally, to finish this topic of the strain, before I show the mixture data and the IFIT, I want to also touch on the thermal cracking because I know University of Illinois have worked very hard on, the, on thermal cracking of binders. Now, this is one of the tests that actually was, was uh, brought here uh, to the US from Europe. Uh, which is a standard, uh, it is an ASTM standard also for plastics, which is the single edge notch beam. And the reason I'm showing this test is to show you that if you're here, you can tell very little about what happens here, particularly when you start the crack propagation. But if you continue to load your sample until you get into the crack propagation, I think you will find a very interesting behavior that could actually give you a better tool. And I would say much uh, more information to pick the right binder. Here's an example. These are two binders. Uh, one is unmodified from Flint Hill, one of the refineries that we all actually know in, in Minnesota. And the same binder modified with less than 3% elastomer in it. And let's say that we were looking at the small strain scale. You can see actually they overlap. There is absolutely no difference in the bending beam rheometer uh, test, whether it's the S on the M, you will find these, these two materials almost on top of each other. Many of you would agree with me. We put SBS 2%, 3%, BBR is so literally, so smallly affected, you can even ignore that there is a polymer in it. However, if I use this cracking test, you can see the difference. You can see the difference as you can see here in the data collected. You can actually visually see the polymer bridging the gap in the crack when it starts to propagating and giving you this very significant residual uh, uh, strength that can be used in the pavement significantly. If you have stretched this material to here, and then the next day, the sun will come out and it warm up. We all know binders can actually heal. And therefore, by limiting the crack uh, propagation or limiting the crack width with these polymers, we can see significantly longer life <clears throat> of these pavements. So what did we have to do here? Not much really, all what we did is the same creep test or the, a similar test with a constant rate of deformation. And you can see the huge differentiation between the two materials just before, because we went into the damage, the large strain domain, if you will. So where are we heading and where have you been? Some of you have been this, seen the, probably this chart. Look, we lived with the hard soft bitumen, the pen viscosity scale, from the beginning of asphalt roads until the 1960s. Then we took really a very good step into the PG grading. And what the PG grading added is only the elasticity and the viscosity, the time dependency of asphalt. And that is very important. I'm not really underestimating the importance of viscoelasticity elasticity and understanding, understanding it. However, I feel now after 25 years from the time when Sharp got, got really finished, Sharp program, we need to go to the third domain, which is the strong versus weak binders by going to the large stresses and large strains. And that is actually a very necessary condition to go to. So how do I envision uh, the end of this? The end of this actually will be using the same tools, but we will have different new parameters. I don't see deficiencies today in the tools we are using, DSR, BBR, and other kinds of things, but we need to go into this larger domains. MSCR is already in the spec. Linear amplitude sweep is on its way. Hopefully, if we put our heads together, we can convince the agencies to adopt it. And I think in the very near future, you will see a fracture test like the ABCD or some other things that will measure the stresses and strains for us. We also have to understand the internal mechanics of our asphalt mixtures. And I know I have only 10 minutes uh, left, so I'm gonna try to really get it done and look at these a few more slides that I have here. 
we have to recognize that the bulk strain on the mix itself is not what the binder actually uh, uh, exhibit inside it. In fact, one of the studies by Professor Iyad Masad and others uh, clearly indicated that straining the binder compared to the bulk mixture behavior is anywhere between eight and 500 times the bulk strain of the mixtures. Therefore, there is also a recognition that this very a complex composite can have different domains geometrically, and these different uh, uh, geometries can result in a variety of strains. And therefore, testing at only small strains could be very difficult. So I promise I'm gonna talk about the study. There it is. So the motivation for the study is that there are many proposals for replacing the fatigue parameter in uh, the specification. There is the delta TC, the Glover row parameter, the master curve, and of course, there's the LIS. We also talk about many pay, uh, different aging conditions and so on. So what we tried to do in this study, actually take mixture IFIT test and binder fatigue test and try to correlate them to get them to the right, uh, if the, to see if there is a relationship and whether it, uh, our hypothesis that large strains could give us better indication of what's happening in the mix uh, is true or not. To select a good test, of course, we went after, evaluated many tests, and we selected the IFIT procedure for this study. Uh, I just show you the LIS test and the strain sweep the LIS test. It is exactly the same as you see here in the IFIT procedure. And in the IFIT procedure, and I don't need really to explain this to you, you are the people who developed it. You have the energy divided by a slope M, which is a characteristic so well, def so well selected to describe the crack propagation. That post-peak slope is so important for testing our hypothesis that we need large strain because that's what the large strain in the mixture is actually. Here you can see actually the pictures of how the cracking is propagating. The importance of this picture is to see where the crack is propagating. There is certainly uh, evidence that most of the cracking is happening in the binder. And therefore these binders are stretched to very high uh, strain before actually they fail. So we selected very different types of modifiers. These are uh, very commonly used in our area in the Midwest, as well as I would say, internationally, from the alveloid to the polyphosphoric acid, to the SBS, to the sulfur, to the bio oil and the rehab. These are the new materials that are supposed to help us with uh, fatigue cracking. So here's the first set of very simple data. Short-term aging of mixtures, long-term oven aging eight hours and long-term oven aging for 16 hours. And these are actually the fracture energy. If you look at these, what's interesting, all of these mixes with very different types of binders, the range is so small, only 500 joule per uh, square meter, which is a very, very small range. You can see actually the variability of many of these mixtures are within that range. And therefore, if anyone uh, that is really specialized in testing, look at this and say, look, people, this is not gonna really be, I'm not gonna be able to, to differentiate between mixes by, the, by, by only losing a fracture uh, energy. Certainly you not do that. You actually added the M uh, slope, the post-peak slope. And now you can see very, very important differentiation between aging levels, as well as between different types of binders. In fact, if you see here, the range is 200% of what you saw of, of, of the average value, if you will. This is what we need to look at, a test that can differentiate between mixes and actually represent the material just before or after it is trying to fill. So this M value captured our attention to look at the binder and see, can we relate binder properties to this uh, M value? So we did our LAS test, the binder fatigue. And here are the A values and the B values. And you can see actually, this is from the fatigue law. You can see actually, we see very good distinction between the A values on the, and the B values. Certainly the A value, which is dependent on the strain sweep, which includes uh, the very high strain levels that I'm after, 
that differentiate between the binders much better than the B, which is measured at 1% strain, very small strain. The, true, the, 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 the problem here is, are there relationships? So what we did, we looked at first the small, relatively small strain. We tried to co correlate the flexibility index of the mixers with the NF estimated at 5% strain, not a very high strain. And you can see actually there is some trend, but the correlation is not strong. In fact, here, if you look here, I have uh, an NF value of about four and the mixture uh, flexibility index was an order of magnitude from about, from about eight to almost 36 or four, four times and so on. However, what we discovered is if we do the analysis with taking into account the strain at which we're picking the binder fatigue, you will see a continuously improving correlation between the mixture flexibility index and between the NF of the binders. In fact, what's interesting, if you plot the R square, the, uh, the, uh, the coefficient of determination between the binder and the mixture flexibility index and the binder NF, you can see a tremendous increase in the degree of determination until you get a certain level, in this case, 15%, and you can see actually the correlation uh, stabilizes. This is a very, very clear indication that what we talked about, that staying at 1% or even 5% or even 10% could not be enough. And therefore, if we want to understand the role of the binder into these mixtures and into the test-like flexibility index, or into fatigue in the field, which you have correlated to, we have to go to higher strains that will give us a better uh, correlation. We verified this model so many times with so many different types of mixes. We have now five different sets of data that clearly tell us if we consider the uh, number of cycles of fatigue from the binder fatigue test at 15% strain, higher strain level, we can get very good degree of determination. What is it going to lead us? Well, this can lead us to establishing a more logical specification where we can rely on the large strain binder test and actually base our limits on the correlation with the flexibility uh, index, if you will. So to conclude, uh, it is really, in my opinion, very humbled opinion, unlikely after all of these years, and I was involved in the original development of the G-Star and the sign delta, but I'm totally convinced that it's unlikely that binder and mixture testing in the small stress or strain domains will be sufficient for predicting performance. The issue is performance is a high strain phenomena. You cannot get uh, uh, our pavements to fail at very small strains or small stresses. And therefore, trying to simplify our testing and making it easier to run within the linear viscoelastic uh, uh, domain is not going to help us uh, in the future. It actually already is hurting us because we go through these cycles of PG grading that don't really give us good correlation to the field. There are significant indicators that testing at large stress and strain can better define the role. I already showed you an example, effect of aging. Anyone today that can tell me, well, I did aging and my fatigue results uh, is going higher and ask me, do you think that's logical or did I do something wrong? I have an answer that probably they did not take care of the actual strain level and that in fact, if our pavements can perform at very small strains, it could be that aging can be helpful for us. Also, if you're looking in asphalt modification, honestly, if you bring me data with GSDAR over sine delta, it doesn't mean much because I can see my results and my data as well as many, many other research centers showing how much different modification can improve things if you go to the large strands. So recent trends in revising binder specification, I think are going in the right direction. I think I will try to encourage people to look at these damage resistance uh, testing, if you will, because I think this will tell us uh, what are the materials that we should be work, uh, we should be using. 
Certainly there is more work to improve our understanding of the binder and aggregate structure and performance. But at least for the binder, I am totally convinced today that without the large strain testing included, I could be probably uh, misled by the data that I'm, I'm, I'm doing. So such work should recognize the large stresses and strains. Finally, I would like to really give a comment on the IFIT. I think this test is gaining more attention. I think the test is not all useful, but actually we can now explain why M value, the post peak slope, is different from one mix to the other. We can very clearly show people why aging that we know very well reduces the M value is a real phenomena that needs to be considered and included into any mixture specification. So I'm very happy actually after all of these years of development of the IFIT, we can bridge the gap between these different scales. Uh, you know, for good reasons, you started with the mixture testing, but we wanted to convince ourselves that this behavior can relate to probably a little bit smaller scale, which is the binder scale. We also did a lot of mastic testing and we can confirm that the, at the mastic scale, we can support your uh, analysis procedure uh, for the IFIT. So I would like to stop here and really thank the organizer of the seminar. I think this is a, a, a really a, a unique opportunity for me to really uh, communicate with Professor al Qadi and with other people uh, watching this, uh, this, this webinar. Uh, and I will be to happy uh, any questions. Again, many thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, Isaac, so I'll much, give you back the lead here. Thank you so much, Professor Bahia, for this very interesting uh, presentation. I think many people have questions, but the first question that I got is from Javier. So Javier, if you want to uh, ask your question. Yes. Hello again, Professor. Hello. I have, I have two questions. So you've been saying, you've been uh, calling our attention to large stress testing for a long time now. And I am curious to know why, when SHARP was developed, why was not more importance given to large stress testing or large strain testing? And then what are we missing to finally move towards binder characterization in the large strain? Very good question. So let me, let me tell you why. Uh, it, it, it was very clear at the beginning that asphalt binders, even unmodified, were nonlinear in their behavior. And for the management of SHARP, uh, there was actually a very good report explaining to them that we're dealing with nonlinear material. And the question was, well, how do you want to capture nonlinearity in the specification? Testing about 42 different sources of bitumen indicating there is one range of linear viscoelasticity for all these binders. Now, what was missing is 42, 42 sources of binders, there were very few modified asphalts in them. In fact, there was none in the original database. There was another SHARP project that introduced the modified asphalt, then we evaluated them. Even when we discovered that when you put modification, the nonlinearity becomes uh, higher, the concern was this industry is not ready to go into nonlinear domains because you have to define the stress, you have to define the strain, you have to tell them how to capture the nonlinearity. So the decision was made uh, by probably many people in the management of Sharp is look, we're gonna go one step at a time. Let's go to performance grading, let's capture viscoelasticity. And if we discover in the future nonlinearity is needed, then we'll capture it later on. I hope that this is a good explanation. Uh, that you can accept. Uh, thank you, Professor. I think we have a question by Mahdi. Mahdi, can you uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your, the question? Because he's not able to send it in the chat. Hello, Dr. Bahio. Uh, Hello, Mahdi. Thank you for your presentation. It was really helpful. Uh, I have a question. It's a little bit long. Could you please comment on the rotting uh, strain stress behavior of a wheel tracking test, such as Hamburg wheel tracking or asphalt pigment analyzer? Uh, how should we harmonize the Hamburg test results with the field performance? You know, what I learned from your explanation for fatigue test, 
Thick asphalt layers can be tested in low strain domain while, while the thin layers should be evaluated in the highest strain domains to capture the real behavior of the mixture in the field. I believe that wheel, tra wheel tracking tests such as, such as Hamburg wheel tracking has a stressed domain, like 100 PSI almost uh, equivalent to the stressed domain that we have in the field. What should we do for the wheel tracking test in terms of a stress strain domain? Thank you. Okay, so this is a very interesting question, Maddie. So if you, if you, uh, you I'm sure you're familiar with the MEPDG and the rutting model uh, in the MEPDG, which yes. gives you the, uh, plastic strain as a function of the initial elastic strain in a power law. Yes. In fact, if you do the right testing in the DSR, you can capture the exact same uh, behavior. Now, binders don't go into tertiary flow, but binders do go into uh, an initial, uh, 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 initial creep, and then they go into a secondary creep. And that secondary creep actually continues for a long uh, uh, period of time. And we can actually capture the steady state uh, uh, creep behavior of the binder. That steady state can be, and I am very, very confident, you will find a very good correlation to the wheel tracking. So uh, unfortunately, in the development of the MSCR, this portion of reality of getting to the steady state was not uh, a focus and they just missed it. So the original proposal was the MSCR should be containing hundreds of cycles at two strain levels, not 10 cycles. And as you know, very recently they modified the test. Now we have to run 20 cycles before you run the 0.1 and then you run the, uh, uh, the 3.2. If you take the MSCR and take instead of 10 cycles, 100 cycles, you will reach the steady state. Once you reach the steady state, this line is similar to the fatigue law. It is giving you the creep rate at a steady uh, condition, which is a phenomenon very well known for viscoelastic materials, not in the linear range, in the nonlinear range. The, the most materials, more viscoelastic material will reach the steady state. Now, to correlate to the Hamburg, Hamburg has two problems. One of them is you're running in water. So you have two effects. You have a, a, you know, dry loading effect, but you also have a moisture damage effect. So we recommend that you can analyze the rutting to separate the dry from the wet. If you take the dry, you find a steady state or creep rate, steady state creep rate from the uh, uh, that I believe is a much, much a better indicator than the single point number of cycles uh, or meters at 20,000 cycles and so on. So in a, in a short answer, steady state creep needs to be established whether it's mixtures or binders. And I, 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 if you look at the data you have for rutting uh, in the Hamburg, isolate the moisture damage, you will find the state creep rate as uh, very clearly in most of these mixes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm just checking if there is more questions. Uh, meanwhile, I, I do have a few questions. Your presentation was, was really nice. Uh, I just have a couple of questions and I see also somebody asked a question and uh, there is actually a couple of questions in the chat. Let's start with them and then I can ask my question if there is more time. Uh, so here, uh, Professor, can you see the question in the chat? I am not opening the chat, but I can try. Let me can just... Can you read them see. for me before I mess it up here? And, yes, yes. And get out of the... So there is the first question is, once we go beyond the LVE range, uh, many ph phenomena occur either uh, simultaneously or one after the other. Uh, has there been any attempt to separate each phenomena such as nonlinearity versus damage? Actually, this is, was one of my questions. Uh, formation of micro crack, and also do you think capturing the entire response uh, instead of the only peak response will reveal greater insight? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think Professor Alkadi will agree with me on, on this. You know, the, the idea of continuum damage was introduced to get away from this question, honestly, because 
you know, many of us feel nonlinearity is nothing but damage. But then, you know, cracking is also damage. So what is the difference? The difference is very simple. In cracking behavior, spending energy opening phases, new phases of the material. As you know, at the molecular level, all these molecules are bonded by bonds. If you break them, you need energy. Before, you can reallocate them. So reallocating of molecules also take energy. And that's what we call nonlinearity. Because if you take a bunch of spheres and you move them around, nothing has been damaged. They're still going to be reorganized again. So imagine your material really able to uh, develop these bonds at all times when you move them around. In fact, metals, as you know, uh, at the molecular level, uh, are atoms full with electrons around them. We throw them the cloud of electrons. You can bend metals without damaging them. That's how we do sheet metal work, right? Take them any way we want. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, in asphalt binder, it's the same thing. These entanglement, you don't have to break them. You can unwind the entanglement and reorganize them in a different shape. That reorganization that we call nonlinearity takes energy. And that energy is, is also damage in some people, you know, uh, minds in a way. Because for us, if we reap of the binder, guess what that means? The aggregates moved away or re, uh, reoriented, and that's rotting. Now, you reach a point where you cannot un unwind these molecules, not cracking the bonding. And that's cracking. So in the damage zone, it is not to capture whether you have nonlinearity or uh, viscous or you have cracking. All what you need to do is actually monitor what sample has cracked or not. Now, people say, well, but that's very difficult to do. Well, again, if you have two options. You avoid the differentiation between viscous flow as parity damage and between cracking. And if you look at uh, uh, Cassie Hines, it has a different last name, but if you search for her name until Hines, you can see how she the DSR sample with the cracking in the fatigue test. So it, it is a very important question. Do we need to worry about it? My answer is, well, it depends on the outcome. If you're interested only there is uh, there is rutting or not, don't worry about it. Binders do not crack at temperatures where rutting in. If you're running a Hamburg, there is no way anyone can tell me you can actually crack the material because I can show you under the microscope. I can tell you with very sophisticated study, all what will happen is uh, uh, the, entang the entanglement will actually move away and the molecules will rearrange themselves. The molecules will result in permanent deformation Cracking of bonds will result in crack. People said the IFIT, we're not sure how cracking is happening. Well, I can show them, you know, that actually the new phases are, are being created. Crack doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you know a, a certain type of crack. If you open new phases, that is a crack. You can call it melt fracture, can it other things. Take a sample from the IFIT, look at it. You can see more. Uh, surface areas than when you started. Thank you, Professor. I we have. I this. Yeah, Professor, yeah. we have one more question now in the chat, uh, which is by Ruxin. Uh, the, the question is uh, about LAS. So the LAS is giving a relationship between the fatigue life and the applied strain. So the question is about, can we convert this, uh, uh, this relationship to a fatigue life versus stress? And if so, how? So instead of having fatigue well, life a strain, we, can we convert it to fatigue life versus stress? And if so, how? In fact, this is a very the topic. Uh, there is one PhD student in our group right now is doing exactly this, the strain amplitude we're running stress amplitude. Now, you know, if you look at the results from your, uh, from your uh, uh, LIS strain amplitude, you know what that curve is. 
there's stress on the vertical axis, there's strain on the horizontal axis. So by using the principles of energy, you know, for viscoelastic material, between the stress and the strain, and the relationship includes not only the G star, but the G star phase angle. So it is not difficult to break up the G star into maximum stress divided by maximum strain, back calculate and solve that equation in terms of the stress amplitude, not the strain am uh, amplitude. And I think there is a way, but other I, we have not developed this equation and hopefully some of your people in your team will think of this. So I don't think it's a hard, uh, a hard thing to do. Uh, after all, if you have strain, there is stress corresponding to it. But the math mathematical formulation needs to be readjusted to do the right calculations. Thank you so much, Professor. I think I, I have one, uh, I can ask my question. Uh, so, so whenever we look at all of the testing that is happening for, for the binder, and you showed that for each different type of uh, distress that you're interested in, we look at a different test from LAS to other tests that are more concerned with fatigue, uh, uh, sorry, with fracture. So my question is, because this is something that I'm currently working on, is don't you think that there is some redundancy in the test that we do is that we can apply different theories to some one test and, and assess multiple factors from one test instead of running multiple? I'm doing it for, for mixes, the love mix level, but I think they can also be applied to maybe uh, the binders. But when I get your insight on this. So I definitely agree with you. I can tell you Delta TCT, a uh, uh, Glover Rho uh, parameter, as well as the M value from the BBR, they're all looking at the same thing. They're all looking at the time dependency, honestly. I mean, if you look at the Delta TC, what are you doing? You're taking a stiffness and the creep rate. Well, that stiffness is one. And if you actually derive it theoretically, you can find why the Delta TC is highly correlated for Glover Rho parameter and so on. You know, in the LIS, you know, the B factor is the time dependency. I can show you the B factor should be correlated highly with the, with the M value from the BBR. It will correlate very highly with the Delta TC. And there is actually Aspot Institute published, a, a, you know, a report on that, that these are interrelated. The problem we have is the energy and the skills required determining each one of them is not equal. Delta TC, people say it's free. If you're running the BBR, you get it without any effort, right? While Glover Rho is probably require a very specialized uh, skills to run a frequency sweep and analyze the data in the right way. LIS, some people don't like to run it because you run two tests and so on. So we are talking about uh, the same thing, but I would encourage you to think about the practicality. If I can be satisfied with the Delta TC, why would I, run an LIS. My problem with the Delta TC, we're uh, pigeoned in the same old problem, which is small strains. Very small strain is being used in calculating the, the S and the M value. And I have evidence to, you know, get me uh, that require me to go away from that. So amount of skills and, uh, and time required is an important factor, but we cannot just depend on the simplicity to pick a parameter. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this very in-depth presentation. We, we learned a lot from it. Uh, thank you for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I, I, I don't I think we- you all will stay safe and we'll see you in person sometime soon. Hopefully. <laughs> thank you so much, Great. Professor. Thank you, Professor Al-Qadi. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Yep, thank you so much, Hussein. You're welcome.